Professor Capps ta uh, has been a faculty, was a faculty of uh, UCSB for 33 years in the Department of Religious Studies, and until 1997, he was elected to the House of Representatives. I first met Walter Capps uh, in April of 1994, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, exactly almost. And I remember I was first time I came to the, I came to the campus to meet our faculty at department chairs in the Centennial House. And after it's done, uh, everybody left. He was the last uh, left, so he and I had a quiet moment together. I met him for the first time. Uh, in his quiet manner, low-key manner, he looked down at his shoes and he talked to me. He said. Uh, he said, I uh, wanted to run for the Congress. And, uh, but I could see uh, the man with this deep, total confidence in him. So when you're totally confident, you don't really need to raise your voice. So uh, his humble style and his scholastic style uh, made me feel that uh, what a valuable, uh, distinguished colleague I'm about to have. So when I went back to Indiana, and uh, it so happened, God's will, and uh, the Sunday morning, I turned on the television. I saw the A&E channel. I don't know if you remember that channel, A&E channel. And here was uh, the Vietnam course. Walter was lecturing. Uh, there was a whole hour of that course. And I told Dylan, I said, you come downstairs, take a look at that. And, and then, uh, I, then all of a sudden, uh, during uh, the memory, during the Vietnam era, mm -hmm. Uh, from 1965 to 69 when I was a graduate student at Cornell came back. Uh, after I graduated the Vietnam War was gone and we all went to our life and I was busy with my career for 20 some years uh, then I was so busy then until that moment it recaptured my memory and all the emotion everything came back. Then I realized after uh, watching that course for an hour then uh, uh, I got a new perspective. And then I thought, what a healing effect that this course had. So that was my first impression with Walter Capps. And then Walter Capps' course, in that year, I understood, went to the 60 Minutes three times. And I, 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 when I came to UCSB, of course, I was always a regular visitor of the Vietnam course at Campbell Hall right here. I just walked from my office, go across to come here, and, and I, uh, in that course, uh, it is so special, so different. Every student, every visitor, and every guest lecturer, and including myself, everyone was a fully engaged participant. And the emotion, the passion, in such a large class uh, were totally captured. You can feel that in the air. So it was an experience I've never seen in any courses in my entire teaching career. I've, I've seen a lot of large classes, but I, have, could not, I could not see a course of that size, a class of that size, one can capture the emotion and feelings of the student in such a concentrated way. And Walter taught his students in that course to search for truth he taught them the value of courage. He taught them the beauty of human compassion. And he taught all of us the importance of contributing to the public good. So with the, with the legacy and the inspiration of Walter, uh, with the encouragement and engagement of Lois, and with the commitment and the dedication of our faculty, our student, uh, our alumni and Vietnamese veteran and our friends, uh, our campus established two years ago uh, under the leadership of uh, so many f distinguished faculty, especially uh, Dean David Marshall, we established the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life. And if you click the website, you'll see that quote of water there. And I just have to uh, repeat that quote again. It says, we are strongest as a people when we are directed by what which, by that which unites us, rather than giving into the fears, suspicion, innuendos, and paranoia that divide. And this, this quote actually describes Lois's 
effort in international peace, your tireless effort, your leadership was clearly reflected in that quote. Every time when you talk about your experience and we can see the connection. So I take this opportunity, want to welcome everyone and especially Walter's former students and our Vietnamese veterans who participate in this course and I looking forward for you to share your stories with us. Thank you. All of you a living tribute to the legacy of Prof Professor Walter Capps. I've been here many times. This is the fourth time with the class. Uh, this is the, um, the kind of event you read about in St. Augustine's Confessions, where the event is so much larger and so much fuller than the amount of time it takes to come here. Walter Capps was so dedicated to his profession, he would take students across the country to see the Vietnam Wall for themselves. He developed the first college class dealing with the Vietnam War. This video from a class trip in 1988. Capps paying respect to so many. Now colleagues are remembering him. I'm Walter Capps. I have the privilege of directing a seminar on the subject of um, religion and Western culture with a special focus on the relationship between religion and politics. And we're meeting, uh, for all of us together here, meeting for several times uh, to dis discuss some uh, topics that um, uh, play a central role in that relationship, religion and politics. And we're concentrating today on the question, why fundamentalism now? We recognize that fundamentalism is a powerful religious, theological, political force in our culture at the present time. We're trying to figure out how, how that happened, why it happened. How did it come about when it did? I'm uh, seated up here with some um, uh, very fine panel members, members of a panel who are part of this class. To my um, far right, and we're only we're talking geography here, not politics, is, is Mark Vickers. <laughs> Next to Mark is um, Julie Ingersoll. Uh, both um, Mark and Julie are graduate students in the Religious Studies Department at UCSB. Uh, Mark is in the um, Master's program and Julie's in the PhD program. Um, Mark has his MA in History from Claremont University. Next to me uh, on my left is Holly Joseph, uh, who is a student here at UCSB and who has done <coughs> some research on Jerry Falwell and the Moral Majority Movement. And next to Holly is Professor Philip Hammond, who is Professor of Religious Studies here at Santa Barbara. So we have uh, a lot of expertise in the room, and we have a lot of interest in this topic. Well, questions are sometimes more important than answers, or at least easier to ask than providing answers. So why fundamentalism now? Keep thinking about it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Congresswoman Lois Capps.
Thank you, Phil. Chancellor Yang, thank you for being here today with Dilling. Thank you for the long, hard support that you gave to Walter during the transition time from him being a professor here, teaching right here, into politics, into the House of Representatives. He used your counsel well. Laura and I will never forget when we accompanied Walter's body back from Andrews Air Force Base in a C-1 transport, and you and Raj were standing on the tarmac. Mm -hmm. Professor Hecht, it's your class now, and you've done great justice to it. Thank you. Clark, Roof, Leonard Wallach, the CAP Center is the continuation of the legacy and much more. Friends who are here, thank you for coming, particularly to the veterans. And you've been acknowledged and asked to stand. I won't do that again, but I want you to, well, you already know how much you meant to Walter. Some of you, particularly from the early days and going on from there. It's wonderful to have Walter's family be here. His brothers, Raj and Doug, bring testimony to Midwest values and an immigrant culture that was part of the family and part of who Walter was. Thank you. And to our children, Todd, who experienced the class as an undergraduate here at UCSB, his wife Julie, and our grandson Aiden, thank you. Laura and your friend Bill, who are working really hard on behalf of a yet another distinguished and much honored Vietnam veteran seeking to be President of the United States. Thank you for being here today. Five years ago, in a scene that looked a little like what we saw in the video, many of us who are gathered here today in this great hall commemorated the 20th anniversary of Walter's class in a ceremony just steps away from the Vietnam Memorial in our nation's capital. And Doug's son, Lindsay, Walter's nephew, had a great role in making that celebration happen. I remember it because we stood together in a circle. It was a cold day. The circle was comprised of the various people Walter had gathered with him on his special journey through life. His family, some UCSB colleagues, students of the class, his congressional staff, and of course the group of brave and far-sighted Vietnam veterans who had joined him to launch the class two decades earlier. During one of the speeches, I watched a gentleman, clearly a Vietnam vet, make his way over from the wall to see what was going on. He joined the circle. For me, that symbolized Walter's life work, from the creation of the class to his service in Congress. He was always putting together circles of people. And then by honoring and celebrating individual life stories, the circles widened, one person at a time. That's the reason Phil Womble is standing, is in his chair here beside me today, as a representative of all the remarkable people Walter do, drew into his circle. Phil, of course, we know as Mr. Gaucho here at UCSB's with his friend Beth DeNoble. He spoke in a different class of Walter's and was co-teacher in that. He's an example of how one person's story can influence and inspire so many. Walter's Vietnam class began as a small, tight circle of recently returned veterans. Many of these pioneers join us today. You are heroes. You not only served your nation in battle, but you also have served it ever since by helping us to understand this tumultuous period in our history. You have served your nation first in combat and then helping us to heal the terrible wounds our society suffered in this war. By being welcomed home in the class, some of you experienced reconciliation and healing yourselves. That is what the circle means. And of course, each year it grew larger. 
more and more students came to share their narratives with more and more student speakers came to share their narratives with the students and more and more students took the class it grew the students learned so much from the veterans also from conscientious objectors from vietnamese people and others who visited the class and these presenters as well learned from the students quarter of a century later under the leadership of Richard Hecht, this tradition continues. And in fact, the class was in Washington, D.C. to visit the Vietnam Memorial just last weekend. And a quarter of a century later, the lessons and legacies of the Vietnam War are still very much alive in our culture and public debate. Walter's 1982 book, which he dedicated to Shad Mishad and Bill Mahidi, both here today, is titled The Unfinished War. How true that is, perhaps especially today. The presidential campaign of 2004, already in full swing, will be awash in images of war, of the Vietnam War, and of our current military engagements. The same questions have swir that have swirled for decades are again at the forefront of our national dialogue. Who fought? Who objected? Who chose the National Guard? Who protested? I can't say exactly what Walter would have thought about the Vietnam War as such a prominent campaign issue in 2004, but I know precisely what he would say about applying the lessons of Vietnam to today's new generation of veterans. So do the veterans who are here today. Walter always counseled that one of the principal mistakes our nation made in the 60s and the 70s was to blame the war on the warrior. We pointed fingers at the wrong people. We didn't welcome the vets home, and we turned our backs on their unique and special needs and also their unique and special gifts. For us to repeat this shameful history would be unconscionable. In some ways, we are. Those returning from the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan are justifiably given heroes' welcomes, but at the same time, some of their benefits as veterans are being slashed. And that's happening in the place where I work. This is no way to honor their service to our nation. Like Walter before me, I've tried to do my job as a member of Congress by listening to individuals' personal narrative. My strong feelings on health care funding for veterans was certainly influenced by a recent visit to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. I have in my mind's eye right now the young Marine I had met there who had been grievously injured by a bomb he was charged with detonating, leaving him one arm, one leg, one eye, 28 years old. And I thought to myself, will we stand by this young man throughout his entire life? Although Walter served in Congress for only 10 months, he did a good job because he had been prepared well in this classroom. His work in the House flowed directly from his work here in Campbell Hall. And his circle of issues expanded beyond the veterans' affairs. The power of that one story, one voice, that can transform and even create legislation. Broadening the circle of issues had begun years before. This man here, Phil Womble, was an example of that. Walter began to teach a course called The Voices of the Stranger, the title taken from Thomas Merton's phrase, we meet God in several ways, through the sacred texts, the sacred traditions, the sacred places, but most especially, we meet God in the voices of the stranger. He was teaching the class in this hall one day, and it was darkened a bit like it is today, and the door opened, and there was the light that streamed in. And in that light, he could see the shadow of a wheelchair. He couldn't make out who was in it. But then he saw a thumbs up. <laughs> and that was Phil. And from then on, they were the best of friends. Phil co-taught the class and was with Walter through thick and thin. No. Well, I bring up the past. There was nobody in the whole world who did not respect and love 
Phil is reminding me of the lesson that Walter taught, which is that, first and foremost, we are human beings, and everything else that describes us is secondary. Thank you, Phil. Tom's struggle, or let me go back, other stories that influenced Walter was one of them, the dear friend of ours, that meant friend to many people here, Tom Rogers. Tom Rogers, a budding political person on the landscape, uh, recently elected county supervisor, remarkable career which could lie before him, struck down with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease in midlife. Their friendship and Tom's struggle and what that meant to Walter led him to introduce legislation to streamline Medicare services for those afflicted with ALS and a bill that, though he wasn't there to, con to complete it, I was so proud to do that on behalf of Tom. One day, Walter sat down with a constituent from Atascadero named Lee Gelf. He had lost his police officer brother in a San Francisco firefight, and his story prompted Walter to introduce legislation successfully passed to ban the catalog or mail order sale of full body armor suits, the kind that had protected the criminal who shot down his brother. Hearing a narrative offered by a courageous Buddhist nun led Walter to play a lead role in the efforts to persuade China to stop its brutal oppression of the people of Tibet. Even though he was in Congress a short time, less than a year, he became well known and well respected for his stand on religious freedom and religious liberty. This last example, of course, deals with, the re with religion in public life. So I want to conclude my, my remarks by expressing my personal gratitude to this university for establishing the Walter Capp Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life, the host for today's event. The Capp Center was created here on campus, supported strongly by Walter's colleagues in Congress, and tied directly to this community and to communities where voices can be heard and stories can be told. It is then another wonderful expression of a circle that connects the different parts of Walter's life and that continues to widen, much like the ripple effect we see in the logo. So I thank you all for coming today to, remembers Walter, to remember Walter's work in the Vietnam class and beyond. And more importantly, to thank you for honoring his memory by choosing your ways to make our world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Capps, for your, for your wonderful remarks. Now, in this next part of the program, we have a number of uh, former students and uh, veterans who uh, were in this course over any number of years. And we've asked, uh, asked them if they would make short remarks about any memories or comments they care to make about the class and the experience. And so that's what we're going to now turn to, and I'll call upon them as listed in our program. And Shad, Mishad, you're first. Transformation, transformation, transformation. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Healing, healing, healing. Is that pretty short, Richard? I know I've only got a few minutes, but actually the class started for me in April of 77. Uh, 
I want to first say that this today is in honor of Walter Capps and his legacy as it continues as we speak, but it is dedicated to Lois Capps and her family for me because behind every great man there's a great woman, and I always have known this, and I know others will talk more about it, but uh, this class opened with a bang, folks, and it opened really uh, prematurely in 77. I, I got a call, and I was a street counselor working with Vietnam vets in a, small, in a, in a large unit uh, run by myself and a couple of other Vietnam vet cowboys in Los Angeles. And I get this call from Walter Capps. This is, hello, this is Shad Mishad. Shad, am I pronouncing it right? <laughs> Shad, Shad, Shad. Who's this? You know, of course, I, I, I had four letter, four, four, four letter word language at that time, and I'm like, who is this? And he said, well, I've called Washington, and I talked to the VA, and they told me uh, that you would talk to me about the Vietnam experience. And from there, uh, I was really fascinated because I'd never heard uh, anybody talk that soft, and I could feel the honesty, and uh, basically he said, would you come dialogue at this think tank in Santa Barbara about your experiences? Dialogue. <laughs> dialogue. I mean, that's bigger than four letters, right? <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of educated, even though I have a southern accent, but I just, what is this dialogue? And he said, well, I've met Fred Downs, another severely disabled vet in Washington who lost his shoulder and arm in Vietnam. And we would like for you to come tell us the truth about Vietnam. And I get chills saying that today. And I know I've already cleared a minute of my time, but that's really how it started. I come in April, and I not only meet Walter, but I first meet his family. Laura, who's here, who is the baby. Lisa, who I got to stay in her room eventually. And uh, believe me, this is when she went on to college, and, uh, and Todd, the surfer, this little toe-headed blonde kid that's sitting in the second row. And I'm like, what is this? This guy is Swedish looking, and his wife, everybody's blonde and whatever, and I'm out of the bowels of South Central and East L.A. I got a southern accent. I look like Wookiee in Star Wars. I mean, a lot of people are still, are you shad, you know? But I mean, I, I, I just, you know, speedo and all. I was weird looking. And I come up here, and... Uh, and we come to this Montecito mega million dollar center called the Hutchins Center, which is a think tank, the Institute for the Study of Democratic Institutions. And we're going up there to speak in contrast and reply to the world's top political scientists of the world. One, Guter Lewin from Germany, who wrote about how we won the war in Vietnam. And many others, and Peter Marin, who is probably the king of grief. It talked about mourning and grief and how the country was suffering. And we were sitting there, and there were wonderful people, but we're like scratching our heads, and we were to come afterwards. Well, Fred is in a suit. I look like a Wookiee monster. We're sitting there in front of all this, in this table. It looked like Camp David. He has the most beautiful chrome arm piece with a hook. It comes out of his suit, and the table is like a pool table, you know, that velvet top with all the microphones, and we're there. Remember, this is April 77, folks. And he says, says who's going first? Because Walter was ready for us to respond. And he says, I said, you go first. He says, good, let me have him. And he cocks his chrome arm, puts it on the table, and drills his hook into this 14,000 table. And we started dialoguing. I finally got it about the Vietnam War. And that's how it started, folks. And Walter, you know, Fred went back to Washington, and I was up the street. And so Walter invited me back for three more dialogues, and he was fascinated. And I just loved to turn loose and talk about the street experiences. And then all of a sudden, he got this idea because he started inviting students to the dialogues, and then he decided to do the class. The first class, folks, was 50 students in a regular classroom, and I did about six of them that year, and we went for two or three hours, and then they came after class. The second year, we did 150 in a little bigger place. The third year, 500, and after that, this room, which is about, what, 900 to 1,000, and then there would be people standing. That was my 20-year-old. 
The second bright idea I got, besides learning what dialogue was, was my sidekick who you'll hear from, right Reverend Bill Mahidi, who ain't that kind of angel, but who is my spiritual and soulmate. And I said, you know, you and Walter are up there because Bill is brilliant, just like Jonathan Shea. They're in this other world. I'm street. I'm trying to learn how to talk because I had to, in five minutes, like I'm getting short now, I had to tell Rosalind Carter and the President's, health on mental, uh, the President's Commission on Mental Health the mental status of Vietnam veterans in 1977 in front of a thousand people and they only gave me five minutes and somebody was flashing a red light or whatever and that was me. I had the whole responsibility in five minutes to tell them how bad it was. And my life has changed. In, in 79, the class officially started. We're celebrating that now. I, did the, I was involved most all of the classes through the first 20 years since Walter's passing. I haven't been back up here. But let me tell you, the class was not just Walter. It was Lois. It was Lisa. It was Todd. It was Laura. And it was every Vietnam vet. As I started, the transformation came through the dialogue, the rap. The veterans that were always one or two initially in the first classes ended up taking the class. It evolved, it transformed into this statement of truth. We discussed the fears and things. We got rid of the paranoia and we got and cut to the chase. And it's changed the world. It changed me. So much healing came out of it. It was the first time I'd ever been invited, not just to dialogue, but to talk about what I saw. Not in Vietnam, but what I was seeing on the streets of Los Angeles and what I continue to to this day. I want to honor the veterans, too. I have my staff here, Mike and Chris for the National Veterans Foundation. I want to tell you it's been the greatest journey of my life. This is so much one of the happiest days of my life. Walter is with me. I don't feel sad. I miss him. I miss looking at the face. But let me tell you, that team is here and that that transformation is going on as we speak and we need to t continue to transform because we're right in the middle which seems to me and I tell it like it is something smells like Vietnam right now folks God bless you Walter and I'm honored to be at least remembered as a part of the Vietnam class in 2004 Amen Thank you, Shad. Wilson Hubble. I can't believe that I have to follow Shad Mishad. It ended badly. There were 60,000 of us who had died. There were hundreds of thousands more of us who were wounded, and many others bore the spiritual scars of what we had seen, what we had done, and what had been done to us. In the end, the outcome of the war was the same as it would have been if we had never been there. Our presence essentially had meant nothing. All that blood, all that sweat, all those tears, and the only thing we changed was the calendar. Vietnam vets have what is a contradictory phrase for this. It don't mean nothing. The literal translation, it does mean nothing. When it was over, America wanted to forget this nightmare ever happened if only we could. And then, not that long after the guns fell silent, Walter Capps discovered his Vietnam and the torment of its veterans and the grief of family members and the struggles of everyone else who had to survive and move on through those troubled times. Walter came to believe that the experience of all these people was having an effect on American culture and that there was a message in the history of this war and the experience of people who had to confront it, that it was important. Walter believed this experience, the one that everybody wanted to forget, should be the topic for a class where it was brought out and examined and discussed. 
Initially, the university was not eager to let Walter have his way. They believed, as did many others, that the impact of the Vietnam War on American culture was still too raw. The emotions were still too strong. The remembrance of the dead and the memories of the living were still too fresh. It all just seemed too soon. Walter had this disarming style about him that Chad talks about. It was part humility, part humor, part charm, part subtle assertiveness that served him well. And he was able to get a reluctant university to go along with his idea. As veterans, we were skeptical. Who is this University of California professor and what does he think he knows about the Vietnam War? But Walter quickly gained our trust by telling us that what we knew about the Vietnam War was important. And together we could help educate his students. He wanted us to be there. And he wanted us to help. And we did. Many people with many different experiences would come to help. Bob Carey, George McGovern, Max Cleland, John Muir, Quang Pham, Shad Mishad, Eugene McCarthy, Sandra Van Oker, Ed Bradley, Mike Madrid, Jim Nolan, so many others. And when Walter left, Richard Heck stepped forward, and the journey continues to this day. And those veterans who came to the class then and now learned that there were many things about this war we did not know. For most of us, our knowledge of the Vietnam, Vietnam War is based on what we were doing, where we were at, when we were there in Vietnam. At UCSB, we were presented with a much broader picture of the war and what it meant to us and our country. And we, too, have been educated through Walter and Richard and all they bring to this class. It has always been about so much more than just war stories. The, cat, the class became and remains an instrument for healing old wounds and making new beginnings. My personal story of life before, during, and after Vietnam, the one I've presented here for 20 years, was developed because Walter asked me to tell it. Until then, it had been just a series of disjointed memories that in some instances I had tried to forget. Just putting it together so that it could be presented was a cathartic experience. My parents never heard the story, nor has my brother, although they have had to live through it with me. Basically, I only tell my story at UCSB because I believe it can make a difference. You see, if just one student can take what I tell them and learn something from it, then my experience and the experience of those who were with me in Vietnam did mean something after all. I tell the students that they have three choices in life. You can lead, you can follow, or you can get out of the way. Because of who they are and where they are today, we are going to expect them to lead. And if they are to lead, stories like mine may be important. And those of us who survived must tell others what we know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jim Nolan. As I looked on the uh, list of speakers today, I, I think I'm the only one who actually never met Walter. When he was doing this class, I was very much in hiding. I was a Vietnam veteran that every time I heard the word Vietnam, I left the room, turned off the TV, put down the paper, turned around, ended the conversation, did whatever was necessary to exit myself from the current situation. 
I've been speaking here since 1995. We just finished, or we're in the process of just about finishing our, uh, the fifth class that I've participated in. Richard has been uh, the leader of the class for the entire time that, that I've been involved with it. And I've been trying to think of, of what it is that's really special about this class. And it's not telling of Vietnam stories because we have the vet centers and we have each other and vet groups and things that we can really do that with if we if we need and we do the telling of the story is very important for us to get out of it to get it out of ourselves to speak it out loud to face the shame the guilt When I first started facing the fact that Vietnam had affected my life and that I needed to face that, I needed to do something about it, went to a vet center and Joe, uh, who's here, uh, talk, we talked about the, the things that happened in Vietnam, but that isn't what was really bothering me. What was bothering me was how it was affecting my life today, how it was affecting my relationships with my family, mostly. And but with everybody else too. And how I was incapable of certain, uh, of feeling certain things, of feeling anything really, because I'd learned not to feel. It was Dr. Shea's book, Achilles in Vietnam Combat Trauma and the Loss of Character that made me focus on what it was that was bothering me so, is that I had lost my character. I went over to Vietnam as a young 19-year-old, impressionable young man of good moral character, and I learned to kill people. And I not only learned to do it, but I learned to do it really well. And I learned to do it, about, do it without so much as a thought, without a feeling, without an inkling. And I hated that about myself, that I was a killer. And it's taken me all this time, 37 years now, to learn to be able to say that out loud, to look at myself, to understand what it was that was different about what I did. I was a sniper in the Marine Corps. I remember a month or two ago, there was an editorial in the paper about the DC sniper, 17-year-old boy who had killed a bunch of people in Washington. And they were talking about his, what proper punishment for him. And there were those that were saying he could never be reformed. Lock him up, throw the key away, kill him. There's no hope for him. Well, if there's no hope for him, then how can there be hope for me? Because that's what I did. Dealing with these issues takes this type of class. It takes a class that is a religion class. This isn't a history class. This is a class where we can talk about our feelings, where we can talk about moral character, where we can talk about forgiveness. It helps so much that those that we present this class to are of the same age of those who rejected us when we returned from Vietnam. These young kids accept us, they give us their love and their respect, and they've taught me so much about life, about love, and forgiveness. And I owe them and this class, and therefore Walter Capps, who I've never met, a great deal of gratitude. Thank you.
Thank you. William Mahedi. This afternoon you have already experienced, and you understand from the preceding speakers, what this class has been all about from the very beginning. This is the Vietnam class today going on. Back in the 70s, when Shad suggested to Walter Caps that I come up and dialogue, <laughs> there was a huge gap. Academics had not begun to study the war, and until the academic study began, it could not be interpreted through an angle of vision that is so crucial in our world. And into this gap stepped a kind, gentle, unassuming, brilliant, and loving and determined Walter Capps. He brought us all together. He invited us to come, and we came. Year after year, we came. And the war was studied not in a laboratory, microscopic type of way, but in a fully human way. Because Walter Capps was a very large human being. And his spirit infected the entire process. And year after year, it went on and it grew. As Lois has said, the circles expanded. And we came. We all came. We were all welcome. And the news media understood. They picked it up. Other academics, other scholars began to study the war, and it changed year after year after year. And Walter went to Russia, worked with the veterans of the war in Afghanistan, the Russian veterans. The mix, mix got richer. And then finally Walter went on to Congress, and he invited Richard Heck to take his place. A very wise choice, because Richard is a man of similar experience, similar dedication, and similar spirit. I've worked, not only a veteran myself, but I worked as a VA clinician, chaplain. And I've worked with students, interns, psychologists and social workers who chose their life's vocation working with veterans because they took this class. That's what this class meant. Now I know that the class goes on and as has been pointed out, as Lois so eloquently pointed out, there are, and others, there are similar challenges now and you will meet those challenges. You will explore the areas that now must be explored, a war that is now underway. You will do this because this is the Vietnam class. Walter's legacy endures and Richard will carry it on. The University of California at Santa Barbara will continue this and the CAP Center will. Jonathan Shea's presence on the program is an indication that you will take innovation and creativity very seriously. And folks, this is not just about Walter Capps. It's about all of us. And that's the way Walter wanted it. So the legacy we celebrate today belongs to us all. But without that kind and gentle man who began it all, none of this would have happened. Walter wanted to study a part of religious and social history. And he couldn't have envisioned that 25 years ago, he couldn't have thought, even imagined, that he himself would become a part of that history. But he did. And if you had ever suggested to Walter that he would become a larger-than-life figure and that he would transmit this kind of enduring legacy, he would have looked down at his shoes and made some kind of aw shucks remark. But that's exactly what happened. We all stand today in Walter's shadow. And Richard, thank you for continuing this marvelous venture. And Todd and Laura, you together with Lisa shared your father with us. We thank you for that. And Lois, most of all, we thank you. Without you, this never could have happened. It was always you and Walter. And thank you, too, for continuing his work in Congress. So today we celebrate not only the anniversary of a class, a venture in which so many of us have participated, but we celebrate the life and work of a truly great man, 
And we celebrate the presence of the remarkable Capps family. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now a current student and religious studies uh, major, Paige Schindler. I've never met Walter Capps. I, um, I was part of the Vietnam class when Dr. Heck taught it just last year in winter. Um, and, gosh, being here and listening to all of these men speak, it's bringing me right back. And um, that class was something that really, it affected me personally, um, politically, <laughs> in a lot of ways that I, uh, it's really hard for me to even be able to explain. I remember the very first day of class. Uh, we came in and and uh, Wilson was talking. Um, he got up and you know there was this class on religion in Vietnam and I'm interested in religion, so okay. And he starts telling us this story about being this young teenager <laughs> in Vietnam and how scared he was and and I was crying for about oh I guess the entire last half of that class. And it ended, and I'm sitting there in a glass room, wiping tears off of my face, thinking, I don't know if I can do this class, because um, if it's going to be like this every day, this emotional assault, it's not going to work. Um, but it was, it was enthralling, and I, I stayed, and I went, and those men who opened their hearts up to us and to me with their stories, they they became my teachers and they became my friends and I mean I love them still to this day. They opened me up to an understanding of war and of violence and of America and of people that I would never have had. Um, now at the uh, near the end of the class we went on a trip, about 30 of us from the class, not everybody could go, to Washington DC to go um, to the Vietnam Memorial. And I remember being there. And at the time, it was, it was March of last year, so Iraq was heating up pretty badly. My father, who's been in the military since 1975, had been planning on retiring, but had recently told me that he decided to extend for another year. And my baby brother had just signed his induction papers. So I'm standing at this wall, thinking about my family and war and all of its consequences and the men that I was with and the stories they'd told and I was standing uh, near the center of the wall it kind of rises as you go into it and it just kind of is so enormous and it just looks like it's going to overcome you and I was staring at it and just in this trance and I was feeling just all this fear and pain and loss and one of the veterans, um, men named Malcolm, came up and he stood next to me and he put his arm around my shoulder and I, I couldn't even speak, he was just checking on me and finally I said to him, I said, I don't understand, I don't understand why why people would make war. I think it was something very eloquent like that. And, and he said, I don't know why. And it was a really honest answer. And I think it was very appropriate. It, it echoed the, the thoughts and feelings that our whole nation had had, that it was still trying to figure out, still in mourning. That's why we had this class. And thinking about it makes me realize that it's most important to remember 
and for us to understand what really happened. Um, that's what this class is about. Here we are, you know, 25 years later, and these men are bringing this story of this unique time in American history to a new generation of people who, I mean, this happened before my parents were even married. How would I know? But it's important for me and my generation to know these things so that we can look back with respect and appreciation for all the things that they've done for us and then we can go forward with that wisdom and that knowledge. Walter Capps, <laughs> he started something very, very special. And I'm indebted to him and I think that all of the friends that I've actually made from that class and all the people that I don't know who haven't are indebted to him too because it's, it's a real jewel here at UCSB. Thank you. Thanks, Paige. Roger Himovitz. The last time I was uh, on this stage, it was with Walter. So it's a special moment for me. Um, it's also very interesting because, as Bill said, the class goes on. And I haven't been probably at a Vietnam class, I don't think, since Walter passed on. But I can tell you today, you had a very small sample of a very special experience. The people who spoke today are an example. I tried to find a metaphor for this class. And I think the best I could come up with was spiritual roller coaster. Um, we didn't know from week to week who was going to show up, the main speakers, and we didn't know which vets were going to show up, and we didn't know what they were going to say, nor did they. <laughs> so oftentimes, it was a surprise. It was always interesting. It was always exciting. It was always emotional. And it was and continues to be a valuable experience. Listening to Paige, who I've never met, gives me a great amount of um, good feeling that the Pages, the people who, were, who attend this class today and the people who attended the class most of the time, were not alive when Vietnam was over. And yet, it continues to hold an important place in their lives. Walter used to say that the Vietnam experience was probably the most important emotional experience of the last century. Some of the um, statistics he used to quote were 100,000 suicides of Vietnam veterans, 50% of the homeless people of my generation, Vietnam veterans. This class has been and continues to be a place of healing. It continues to be an important part of our nation's history. Walter was one who was able to make us look at ourselves, both the good and the bad, and helped us through a very difficult time. I am so pleased that the Walter Capps Foundation and the center, the Walter Capps Center, exist to carry on that legacy. And I thank you. Thanks, Roger. Quang Pham. I was neither a Vietnam veteran or a student. In December 1990, I was a Marine lieutenant getting ready to fight in that war that supposedly kicked the Vietnam Syndrome. I had read in Stars and Stripes magazine that there was this professor named Walter Capps that's teaching this course on Vietnam. And I simply just wrote him a short letter before the Gulf War started and I asked him, how can you teach Vietnam 
without talking to the Vietnamese. He never replied, at least until 1993, when my sister, too, who worked with Walter in Congress and with Lois, approached him after class hesitantly and said, my brother wrote you a few years ago, so be careful what you ask. <laughs> the day after two approached him, I got a call and an invite to come here. That was in 1993. And as I look back on that remarkable day, how could someone, a renowned scholar, someone who had mastered this lesson plan on Vietnam, why would he listen to a, a Marine? <laughs> Why did I want to speak? Because growing up in this country, I was 10 during the fall of Saigon. All I heard was the American experience. When I was a Marine lieutenant, a captain, and a major, all I heard was the American experience. Yet little is ever talked about the loss of our former ally. An ally, the only one we've ever abandoned on the battlefield according to James Webb, famous historian, screenwriter, and Marine veteran. An ally whose casualty as a nation was 40 times ours. There are now 1.5 million Vietnamese Americans in this country, and I can't speak for all of them, but I'm sure most of them will tell you we are very grateful that America didn't forget about some Vietnamese. As a child, I already knew that Americans weren't the only ones who were fighting for South Vietnam. For, entire, for my entire childhood, I saw my own father go off to war. He had enlisted in 1954 after Dien Bien Phu. Nearly 275,000 Army of the Republic of Vietnam soldiers died in the war, among two million Vietnamese total. The war's end in 1975 did not mean peace Half a million were rounded up for re-education camps, my father among them, for 12 years. The longest American POW in Vietnam was eight and a half years. Another 60,000 died in the re-education camps. Who knows how many died escaping communism? I wish the survivors would have had the kind of help and support for post-traumatic stress syndrome as discussed in Dr. Shea's book. As I sat backstage waiting for my turn to talk, suddenly I was jolted back to that day in April 75. I was only 10. But as I realized every year I came to this class, I started to become a student instead of a speaker. Walter's class was helping me prepare for my own reunion with my Vietnam veteran, my hero, my father. So to the Walter Capps Center, to the Capps family, thank you for allowing us that other side of the war, the side that was once an ally of America, to talk about Vietnam. To the Vietnam veterans, as a former citizen of South Vietnam, thank you for your service. Walter, I will never forget you. Well, I want to thank all, this, all the speakers. Uh, this has been remarkable testimonies and remembrances of uh, both uh, the past and the current experiences of this course. Um, you know, part of what, what's going on here is that we're, to an extent, reliving the course in the fact not only hearing from these speakers, but the stage is set up somewhat like it used to be during the class. So let's thank all the speakers for these testimonies and experiences. <laughs> Professor Richard Heck, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you very, very much, Clark. And I've a, I was the one responsible for the video, but I could not, um, I know it's a little primitive, and, but I had to see Walter, you had to see Walter, you had to see the class, and to see the immense range 
of his teaching ability from working in this class with 966 students to the intimate seminars that he taught. And I thought that seminar where he introduced the problem of fundamentalism um, captured so much the way that he could come right to the heart of an issue um, as a brilliant teacher. Um, before I introduce our speaker, and please don't get nervous about the time. Um, whenever I think you try to do something like this, you fall a little bit behind schedule, but we have a great, great individual to listen to in a moment. And before I introduce him to you, I also would like to offer my deep gratitude to the men and women who have contributed so much to this course over the years. Many of them are here today with us, and you have heard from just a small group of them. But I want to express within that general gratitude to all of you a special acknowledgement of my co-teacher, Wilson Hubble, who has been with the course, as Chancellor Young pointed out, for 20 years. Uh, he has his own professional life, and he has sacrificed much to maintain his loyalty to the Vietnam course and to the thousands of students who have taken it and have heard Wilson and learned from him. I want to tell you just one other thing, that uh, when Walter asked me to take the course for a few years until he returned from Congress, he said, Wilson will help you. And I said, I'm, I really thank you, and uh, I need somebody. And, um, and uh, Wilson did help me. And I remember we had a telephone conversation once, and I said we had one more mission um, to do. And Wilson, you have carried out that mission uh, with such uh, a level of commitment and dedication uh, that it's to you that this campus and community and these students owe so much. Wilson. Now, we could not have a better speaker to mark this anniversary than Dr. Jonathan Shea. I am not going to, as my notes that I wrote up yesterday would indicate, summarize his contributions. And I hope, Jonathan, you will allow me to admit that uh, in introducing you. Uh, I suggest you look at the back of either of his two books, uh, Achilles in Vietnam, Combat Trauma and the Undoing of Character, and then Odysseus in America, Combat Trauma and the Trials of Homecoming. You will see that both of these books are widely acclaimed by classicists, by psychiatrists, by historians, by veterans, uh, and uh, politicians of various sorts. Um, I think that Jonathan Shea has produced nothing short of one of the most brilliant uh, cultural interpretations of one of the most characteristic and powerful and painful marks of war. I would like to just read for you a moment the concluding paragraph of his Achilles in Vietnam. He writes, with what kind of human beings do we want to surround ourselves for our own flourishing? If we want to live among equals with strength and candor, among people with, as Euripides says, free and generous eyes, the understanding of trauma can form a solid basis for a science of human rights. There is, of course, no scientific basis for picture preferring to be surrounded by free equals rather than by cowering slaves. When Lincoln wrote, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master, he did not claim any rational compulsion for what he would not be. This vision of a good life for a human being is an ethical choice and cannot be coerced. It can only be called forth by persuasion, education, and welcoming appeal. So Jonathan Shea concludes his first book, Achilles in Vietnam. Dr. Shea situates his work with the issue of combat trauma at the very heart, I believe, of the responsibilities the program of the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life, 
which indeed seeks to strengthen our society. That's why he's a, the best speaker we could have today. But even more importantly, I think there is something that is shared deep between Walter Capps and Jonathan Shea. For both of them lay claim to the heritage of Abraham Lincoln, that there are deep and lasting responsibilities we must bear and carry forward. Walter saw that in Lincoln's second inaugural address when he called the nation to bind up the wounds of its civil war, to care for the wounded, the widow, and the orphan. In Lincoln's words, Walter Capps and Jonathan Shea seek to ennoble us as citizens and as human beings. Please welcome Jonathan Shea. You folks don't seem to realize you're stuck with me. My head is so swollen at this point, I'm not going to be able to get through the door. <laughs> it, it, it is also profound for me to have had compellingly verified my claim that the veterans I serve do not want other young kids wrecked the way they were wrecked. I am their missionary, and I beg people to take me seriously when I say I am their missionary. <laughs> like any missionary, you can count on it that if you slam the door in my face, you're going to find me climbing in the window. <laughs> and so I, I am really right in their face in my efforts to get the American Armed Forces to renovate their culture, their policies, their practices, so as to reduce psychological and moral injury. Now, I'm going to look at what I wrote, and heaven help me. Congresswoman Capps, Chancellor Yang, Professor Roof, Professor Hecht, Professor Wallach, esteemed veterans and partners in the hard and rewarding work of bringing veterans home. Some of you I have known for years. I, Bill Mahady is one of my heroes, and Shad, Mishad, and I have crossed paths a, a number of times over the decades. And it is truly a pleasure and an honor to be asked to give this anniversary address. I never knew Walter Capps. I'm grateful to a Boston-area Marine veteran of Vietnam, Bill Newell, who helped to get the course started, he said, 25 years ago. He invited me to his house last week to see a video. So in addition to what I've seen today, Walter Capp's face, I may be getting too many microphones in the job here, Walter Capp's face and his voice are with me as I speak with you. It was really clear to me watching him on this videotaped pro television program with the veterans, that he had an extraordinary capacity to listen, and that he listened both with his intellect very intensely engaged, but also with his heart. And in the clinic, in 16 years of working with combat veterans, I have learned that if you don't know how or learn how to go naked to show your humanity and to react with humanity to the pain and to the fury of the veteran before you, they will never even begin to trust you. They'll just blow you off. 
Okay, I'm going to breathe. My cue says breathe. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to dust off a wretched Hollywood cliche of the soldier's homecoming. A crowd of wives and parents and children on the tarmac and over here the C-17 has just pulled up and now it's pivoting and they're showing off that the C-17 can do that. That's why it's worth a quarter of a billion dollars. Anyway, so it's pivoting and slowly, slowly the ramp is coming down. Close shot of Penelope Spouse. The soldiers start pouring off. They stream onto the tarmac and one of them breaks into a run toward the camera. It is Ulysses Veteran. Slow motion of Penelope and Ulysses running toward each other. That slow motion's a special effect, by the way. <laughs> but no! The wrong special effect cliché has now run into the film. Before they can reach each other, the ground between them suddenly splits and it yawns apart between them with chunks of tarmac breaking off and very convincingly falling down, down, down. So with that tragic comic, even farcical introduction, I bring you to the theme of my address. What is it that breaks open the chasm between returning Viet, uh, veterans and the civilians that he or she returns to? What can we do to prevent the earth from swallowing so many veterans and so many families? Now, a logical presentation would go, what we should do before, and what we should do during, and what we should do after, and how to get Ulysses and Penelope together the way they're supposed to be. Now, I promise to give you that my overview of what I think should be done before we're finished, but as many of the previous speakers, I do want to acknowledge this audience, and specifically the two broad parts of the audience. One is the veterans and their families. I don't know if there are any active duty personnel here or reserve personnel here and their families, but the veterans and the military personnel and their respective families on the one hand, and on the other hand, everyone else who has come here with goodwill and who really do care about service members and veterans. My hope is, and you're already clearly doing this, that by the end of this talk, both groups will look each other in the eye and say, you are part of my future, and I am part of yours. Now, I've already introduced the imaginary film character, Ulysses Veteran. Ulysses was the Latin name for the hero of the Greek epic, the Odyssey. His name in Greek was Odysseus. The name of the epic comes from his name, Odysseus. You'll hear a lot about him in the course of this talk, and I'll occasionally switch back to the name Ulysses, just to remind you that whether you've read the Odyssey or not, you know many of the stories about Odysseus, whether it's from Kirk Douglas's film Ulysses or from watching the Saturday morning cartoons with your kids. He is the brains behind the Trojan horse. He's the trickster who puts out the light for the Cyclops. Outside of Bible stories, there is probably no single figure from ancient literature who is so widely recognized as Odysseus Ulysses. Penelope is his long-suffering wife, 
faithfully awaiting his return and fighting off her own demons. Forgive me, I'm, it, it is emotionally important for me to be able to make eye contact with the audience. And I wonder if we could bring up the house lights and maybe cut down on the stage lights a little bit so that it's not so, so much of a chasm here, talking of chasms. Now, so who was Odysseus? Well, he was a war veteran. He fought ten long years at Troy as one of the Greek officers, and the epic, the Odyssey, is the story of the next ten years, the time it took him to get back. In my new book, Odysseus in America, Combat Trauma and the Trials of Homecoming, I show that this ancient yarn really is about the obstacles to returning to civilian life if you know how to read it. I'm going to take just one of these scenes, the Cyclops episode, from this vast and very crowded tapestry to illustrate what we can learn about the universal problems of returning combat vets. Now, if you are the spouse or child or parent of a veteran, your loved one's readiness to take risks, even to seek out danger, can be incredibly frightening and then wearing and finally infuriating. Here is what the poem tells us. Odysseus and his flotilla of 12 or 50 oared ships are well and truly lost They've been carried by the winds to the, the land of the high and mighty Cyclops, lawless brutes. They make camp on an island just offshore, and Odysseus leaves his squadron, takes his own ship and crew across the narrow water to probe the natives over there. What are they? Violent, savage, lawless, or friendly to strangers, God-fearing men? This is Odysseus speaking. He's telling his own story. At the time, Odysseus, the naval officer, had no reason to know anything about where the wind had blown him, even though, as he relates the tale to the Phaeacians, Odysseus, the storyteller, knows exactly what he faces, giant cannibals. But in the context of the story, he has it, he, it seems reasonable to do a reconnaissance. The squadron has lo lost its bearings. Reconnaissance is called for, and any responsible commander would see it, see it competently done. Odysseus and his crew cross the small stretch of water. Now closer, looking up from the shore, Odysseus can see that the cave is a giant's lair. This prompts him to take a skin of extra potent wine, such as a modern commander might take some non-standard weapons that he thinks the mission requires. Odysseus leaves most of his crew with the ship and with twelve picked men climbs up the, to the giant's den. They enter it wide-eyed. The owner is not at home. Odysseus's men plead with him, This is bad shit, Captain. Let's get out of here and grab what we can. But Odysseus turns stubborn. But I would not give way, not till I saw him, saw what guest gifts he'd give me. His curiosity to see what Xenia hospitality gifts the giant would give him cost six of his men their lives. You can see that I'm reading this, the, this epic through the eyes of modern military people because by the end of this book, there is a charge sheet for the court-martial of Captain Odysseus. This is no ominous hunch. 
He knows that a giant inhabits this cage, but nonetheless he keeps his men there in danger. One of the veterans I have worked with for many years once, once punched his sister's husband in the side of his head as he passed him in the back hall of their house. What happened in the ensuing flight doesn't, fight doesn't really matter, but really what does matter is why he did it. Quote, I just wanted to see what would happen. Another veteran says that a couple years after returning from Vietnam, he dove off a roof. Was he trying to kill himself? No. Quote, I just wanted to see what happened. Sometimes you do that. Commentators on Odysseus' behavior with a cyclops are divided between those who emphasize his, quote, curiosity, praising him as a sort of ancient proto-scientist, proto and those who emphasize his greed, his hope for a guest gift of immense value. In the ancient Mediterranean, some extremely valuable prestige items circulated as gifts given from one noble to another. I see the adventure with the Cyclops in a different way entirely, and that is as an emblem for combat veterans' attraction to danger. An, an attraction that has cost so many of them their lives after returning from, after returning home, and which has tortured those who love them with untold hours of fear that they won't survive. I quote from a Washington area veteran's poem, which he wrote after the suicide of Lou Puller. I drive Chu Yin the veteran's name for his motorcycle, to the wall in a demon rage. We make the trip in eight minutes. If she'd been flesh and blood, I would have ridden her to death. Vietnam veteran bikers did not invent dangerous fast motorcycle riding. The most famous World War II combat veteran, Lawrence of Arabia, died from it. These are Lawrence's words. And he's talking about the lanes of Oxfordshire where traffic moved at perhaps 25, maximum 30 miles an hour. After a mile or two, I said to Thunder, the name Lawrence had given his motorcycle, we are going to hurry, and thereupon laid back my ears like a rabbit and galloped down the road. It seemed to me that 65 miles an hour was a fitting pace, but often we were 90 for two or three miles on end, with old thunder trumpeting, ha, ha, like a war horse. Veterans' behavior has been variously called irresponsible, impulsive, judgment-impaired, thrill-seeking, danger-seeking. But those adjectives don't get at the sense that the dice must be rolled. In addition to hungering to acquire the guest gifts, Odysseus just wanted to, quote, see what would happen. Prolonged combat leaves some veterans with a need to, quote, live on the edge. Yes or no? Yes or no? They pose the question to the cosmos over and over again. The veteran who dove off the roof was not curious what broken bones felt like. Odysseus's irresponsible impulse to see what are they, violent, savage, lawless, and what guest gift he would receive, makes perfect sense as something that veterans of much fighting simply do. It is as if, having li lived in a world of chaos, where the dice are constantly rolling, the calm, plan-filled responsibility, or for that matter, of military service in garrison, is intolerable. They speak of it as, quote, boredom, that somehow grows to unendurable proportions. Tennyson captures this boredom in his poem, Ulysses, which opens with Ulysses calling himself an idle king. I meet and dole unto a race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. 
Much have I seen and known, battle with my peers, far on the winging, win, ringing plains of windy Troy. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust, as though to breathe were life, life piled on life were all too little, and little remains. So just in part to see what happens, Odysseus has his men settle down to dine on the giant's food and wait. Who are the lawless brutes here? Homer has made the point a bit ago, a bit earlier, that they have plenty of stores in their ship and have just gorged themselves on wild goats. These men are not starving. Necessity is not driving them. Learned commentaries on the Cyclops episode have never claimed that ancient Mediterranean custom permits uninvited strangers to walk in and eat some, someone's food in their absence. Ironically, we have been told that a refined version of this same misconduct is going on back home when Penelope's infamous suitors are eating her and Telemachus and Odysseus himself out of house and home. Over and over, we are given to understand that the suitors deserve the death that Odysseus rains down on them for eating the supplies uninvited. Polyphemus the Cyclops return and tidies up some domestic chores, at first not noticing the intruders. And like a householder returning for the evening, he locks his front door. Odysseus and his men are trapped. Polyphemus has deftly plugged the entrance with a rock so big that 22 wagon teams could not budge it. Then he finally discovers them. Strangers! Who are you? Where did you sail from over the running sea lanes? Or are you wandering rogues who cast your lives like dice and ravage other folk by sea? Because Homer has put these words in the mouth of a, mouth of a brute, it is easy to overlook that that is, that is exactly what Odysseus and his crew have become, men who cast their lives like dice and ravage other folk. It's vintage Homeric irony. Vietnam veterans who at the time they enlisted had imagined themselves marching down Main Street, head held high with people gesturing, there, there, you see him? That's him, that's him. They found themselves keeping silent about their military service or lying outright that they had never served. Because of both the political climate of the early 70s and the well-founded fears of job discrimination, many veterans made themselves nobody on the job, in school, in social situations, at a time when every fiber in their body screamed that they be known. Odysseus pursued an active strategy of nobodyhood as a means to escape the Cyclops. Vietnam veterans were galled by their invisibility, the comprehensive indifference of the civilian world. Fame, kleos, was what the Homeric Greeks ri uh, risked and often lost their lives for. Kleos is the exact opposite of being a nobody, of not being someone. A key element in Odysseus's trickery lay in his ability to suppress his warrior identity and go against what was crying out in him. Remember that he saved himself and his men from slow death by thirst, trapped in the cave by not killing the drunken Cyclops that first night. He saved them again by telling the Cyclops that his name was Nobody rather than proudly identifying himself by his patronymic and his given name as the heroic code would lead him to. 
The trick works, and Odysseus and his men ride to freedom slung underneath the giant's fat sheep. Once out, they drive the flock down to the shore, board, pull their ship away from the beach. But now Odysseus' self gives way, and he begins to vaunt, to boast. So, Cyclops, no weak coward it was whose crew you bent to devour there in your vaulted cave, you with your brute force. Throwing toward the sound, the blind Cyclops heaves a rock over them so huge that the backwash alone pushes them back to the beach. Frantically, they pull and row themselves away, but then Odysseus taunts the giant for a giant. For a second time, his shipmates beg him to be prudent and self-restrained as they had when they entered the cave to begin with. Now, six grisly deaths later, he cannot resist arrogant taunting. His crew begs, So headstrong, why? Why rile the beast again? Good God, that brute can throw. So they begged me, but they could not bring my fighting spirit round. I called back with another burst of anger, Cyclops! If any man on the face of the earth should ask you who blinded you, who shamed you so, say, Odysseus, raider of cities, he gouged out your eye, Laertes' son who makes his home in Ithaca. With this boast, he seals the fate of his shipmates. This Cyclops is the offspring of the sea god Poseidon and Polyphemus prays to his Olympian father with this curse, using the grid coordinates that Odysseus has given him like for a missile strike. Hear me, Poseidon, grant that Odysseus, raider of cities, Laertes' son who makes his home in Ithaca, never reaches home, or if he is fated to reach his own native country, let him come home late and come home a broken man, all his shipmates lost, and let him find a world of pain at home. Just that one line is and it has extraordinary resonances for so many veterans' real experiences, a world of pain at home. Homer says that the god heard his prayer, and the rest of the story shows that it was fulfilled. Odysseus alone returns alive. None of the 600 or so from Ithaca who sailed with him survive. Odysseus has greatly underestimated the potency of this adversary, just as the Cyclops has underestimated this cunning mortal. Now I'm going to turn to another number of other ways that combat widens and deepens the gulf between veterans and their loved ones, veterans and their employers, veterans and their neighbors. A veteran said to me, if you know, knew what I know, it would fuck you up too. The main reason that veterans clam up about what they've been through is that they want to protect us from the terrible knowledge that would injure us. And they are right. You cannot hear the bad news from the battlefield and be unchanged by it. In the clinic, this is a major issue because so-called secondary traumatic stress is one of the main reasons that people drop out of this work. Veterans don't want to hurt us, so they stuff it all down. Closely related to this is the sense of being unclean. For many vets, this had a powerful and horrifying physical manifestation, both in jungle rot, the multitude of fungal infections in the groin and the feet and all other moist parts of the body, but also in the ground-in dirt that they deposited on the bathtub for weeks after returning from Vietnam. For other, it w others, it was a matter of blood pollution. 
Throughout history, human societies have offered rituals of purification for those who have shed blood. Ours offers none. One veteran that I've worked with had a father who was a World War II merchant marine who was torpedoed in the North Atlantic. He met his son at the door when discharged shortly after returning from Vietnam and handed him a $50 bill with these words. Here, get drunk, get laid, and I will see you at the Union Hall on Monday morning. That is not purification after battle. Now, anthropologists tell us that pollution is the sacred in the wrong place or the wrong time. The scholar, the French scholar Georges George Dumézil has said that the problem of the returning warrior is desacralization. That's an interesting thing to sort of chew on. The problem is desacralization. Now, when I use the word sacred, please remember that sacred does not equal good. It is pre-ethical. Sacred means powerful, terrifying, daunting, infinitely fascinating. It rivets the attention. You cannot think about anything else or look at anything else. And the emotions that go with contact with the sacred are enormously familiar to those of us in the clinic who work with severe combat PTSD because those are the emotions of exaltation and abjection, being slammed to the earth or being just energized and lifted up in, in a sometimes terribly destructive way. In my public writing and advocacy, I have... No. Okay, well, I'm shifting gears here. I'm going on to another topic. In my public advocacy and writing, I've appealed for renovation in our military institutions to protect service members from psychological and moral injury. I exhort the American citizenry to, in addition to demanding such renovation, to do other work as well related to purification. We have found ourselves incapable of offering this to those who have done the terrible acts of war on our behalf. I believe this is something to be done jointly by people from all of our religions, from the arts and from mental health, and from the ranks of combat veterans, but for sure not from the government. What I have in mind is a communal ritual with religious force that recognizes that everyone who has shed blood, no matter how blamelessly, is in need of purification. Those who have done something blameworthy require additional purification and penance if their religious tradition provides for it. The community as a whole, which sent these young people to train in the profession of arms and to use those arms, the community as a whole is no less in need of purification. Such rituals not, must be communal with the returning veterans, not something done to them or for them before they return to civilian life. This new cultural creation must stay free of the taint of sectarian, political, and ideological partisanship, which would willingly hijack such a ritual for their own purposes. Of course, people who have no religion or who have left the one they were born into must be welcome to take part as well. All modern soldiers go into battle under constraint. They have enough to carry without being blamed or credited with a political decision to fight that war. I have no desire at all to get tangled up in legalistic what-ifs. 
that would be raised by any governmental participation in such rites of purification. And I hope it's obvious that what I have in mind has nothing to do with impunity or immunity or amnesty for military crimes that should be prosecuted. I am not trying to ditch the Nuremberg Principles. I do not know how the creation of such a new and widely accepted cultural practice can be accomplished, but I do know that we need it. The chasm of yawning between a veteran and others is also a chasm of communication and understanding. I can't explain, you wouldn't understand, are words that many wives and parents have heard from returning veterans. Supposedly, words fail. The English language has plenty of resources for horrifying experiences like, quote, every time I gave him mouth to mouth, more blood poured out of his chest. What veterans are often saying is, it's too nasty for me to tell you. But other times, it's not nasty that's the problem. It's the naked nerve ending, my skin has been peeled, feeling of vulnerability to people's reactions. Because in the words of one veteran, quote, this is sacred stuff. Many civilians don't know that what, know that what they are asking when they ask a combat veteran to matter-of-factly tell them about exper their experiences is that it's akin to asking about a religious conversion. You don't talk about combat the same way you talk about what you did over the weekend. The, the analogy I've sometimes used is you come into your workplace on a Monday morning and you say to the person at the next desk or in in the next office, so how was your weekend? And that person says, oh, pretty good. I spent the weekend looking on the face of God. How was your weekend? <laughs> and that's a little bit like what sometimes happens. Here's one veteran who came back from a hellish one year, actually 13 month tour, combat tour in Vietnam, and went quote, down to the corner to be, and was greeted, oh, hi, haven't seen you in a while. You've been away? <sighs> now, compared to the privation and squalor of combat duty in any war, Americans are as rich and complacent and avid for entertainment as the Phaeacian nobles who hosted Odysseus and to whom he was telling these stories. When they want to hear his war stories, they want to be entertained. Furthermore, if they have read a book or two, they want to be congratulated both for their interest and the depth of their knowledge. These civilians want to see themselves as really smart or really compassionate or really wise. And I just mentioned that this isn't something new to Vietnam. All Quiet on the Western Front had a sequel that was published in 1931, 1931 and it dropped completely out of sight and the sequel follows the cast of characters in All Quiet on the Western Front back to their hometown after their demobilization. This is now, after all those years, available as a trade paperback. It's called The Road Back by Remark. And it is astonishing how much of the Vietnam veterans' experience is right there in this post-World War I story. Uh, it's, it's profound. And families and employers are not good, this is yet another topic, <laughs> not good at understanding the utterly binding moral obligation that soldiers in a tight unit feel toward each other. Even civilian, even the fact that civilians do sort of understand that cohesion is a
protective factor in, in, in a fight and a combat strength multiplier, they don't recognize that this can persist into civilian life. So they don't take kindly to the veteran receiving a phone call and disappearing out the door without a word, day or night, only to return many hours or even days later exhausted and distracted. These are hard things to get. So back to my promise to uh, say something about before and after, and I am about to wrap up. What we should do before is to strengthen our military unit associations, provide volunteers within the military unit associations with peer counseling training, especially not only the veterans but their wives, and so that in my imagination, I see someone coming to Camp Pendleton, assigned from entry-level training and boot camp and the School of Infantry, assigned to a battalion at Camp Pendleton. And they're met there by uh, preferably, the, the, preferably a couple. I mean, often even Marine entry-level uh, recruits today are married. They're met there by a couple from the 1st Marine Division as Association. You're part of us for life. And to coordinating with the Family Support Network on the base to provide education to both of them to, in making this transition and then preparing and educating both of them for what it means when this Marine goes on a float and is deployed for six months to God knows where. And then while the Marine is away, the spouse is getting more education on what does it mean for this, for your husband or wife to come back from this deployment. You have to realize that if he or she seems distracted and is focused on the other members of the unit and not on you. It's, there's nothing wrong with you. It's not that he doesn't care about you and has lost interest in you. And a great deal more education if they've been in a fight while they were on that float. And so, so you get the concept. Now, during is what the gist of my pitch to the active duty force is and that is that the institutions have to be remodeled so that every single service member who goes into harm's way has the three positive resources. Those three resources are positive qualities of community in the face-to-face -face unit of which stability is absolutely crucial, so-called cohesion. The second is that every person who goes into danger should have expert, ethical, and properly supported leadership. And the third is prolonged, cumulative, and highly realistic training for what they actually have to do and face. So my mantra is cohesion, leadership, training. And anything you need to change in the institutions to improve on those, you change them. Then after, remember this is before, during, and after, after is what I've been saying, community, purification, connection. So there is a terrible pattern in our past wars and veterans returning from past wars, which I despair that I'm a f we will repeat, and that is that the veteran will burn through his personal and social capital, will burn through his marriage, burn through jobs, burn through the esteem of his neighbors, maybe get into scrapes with the law, maybe drink and drug, 
And then when he is really at the bottom, then he may overcome his pride enough to ask somebody for help. The point is not to grab people by the throat and say, you need help. The point is to get people into contact with the veterans early enough with credibility. And I imagine this little scene again with the imagined uh, peer counselor in the First Marine Division Association. Uh, the young Marine comes back from Afghanistan or Iraq and the Vietnam vet from the 1st Marine Division says, so how you doing? Any kickback from what you did over there or what you saw? And the young Marine, being proud, is probably going to say, well, I'm fine, and what the fuck's your problem? <laughs> and the, because this Vietnam vet has the credibility, he can say, well, you're a lion sack of shit. I can see by your eyes that you ain't sleeping, so talk to me. I've been there. I know what this is about. And that, in my imagination, or if you want to use a more pompous word, vision of it, might be the difference between this Marine having to go all the way down and have to seek resources from the VA, heaven help us, or the prison system, even worse, or a detox. Because the peer counseling works. I have the privilege of knowing the person who runs the combat stress control program for the Royal Marines, the commandos in the UK, and it's all done with peer counseling. And it, it, it works. So it's been a pleasure and an honor to speak with you.